Hey, welcome back, everybody. I don't know, I was uh, peeling a lemon there, which is kind of an appropriate uh, segue into uh, Dr. Jaffe's presentation. Um, our next uh, guest today is uh, Dr. Karen Jaffe. She's an OBGYN who was diagnosed with Parkinson disease in 2007. And since her retirement, uh, she has been focusing her work on local and national Parkinson disease advocacy issues. She's a member of the Michael J. Fox Patient Council, serving as a liaison between the Parkinson's and research communities for the purpose of advancing a cure. In 2011, Dr. Jaffe and her husband, Mark, created a foundation called Shaking with Laughter that's raised almost a million dollars uh, since they started. In 2015, together with other like-minded individuals, they founded In Motion up in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a community center for people with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And their mission is to help people with Parkinson's disease every day. Dr. Jaffe has won numerous awards, including the Red Cross Heroes Award, the Irene Zeman Award for Volunteerism, the World Parkinson's Program Community Service Award, and University Hospital Neurological Institute Champions for Parkinson's Disease. Uh, Dr. Jaffe attended Kenyon College, Wright State University School of Medicine before completing a residency at the University Hospital of Cleveland. Um, joining us now is Dr. Karen Jaffe. Thank you so much for being with us and I'm gonna turn it over to you. David, thank you. That was a very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be with you all today. I would like to extend a special warm welcome to those of you who might be attending their first PD conference ever. It seems like just yesterday when I attended mine. While it was memorable on several levels, for me, the most impactful moment came with the very first speaker of the morning session. At the front of the room was a very chipper fellow who was there to start us off with some movement activities. Not as, not as creative as certainly what John just showed us. So the day began with this. Good morning, everybody. It's time to get up and get moving. I want you to stand up from your chair and then sit back down. And if you are able, do that four more times. I looked around with a profound sense of sadness to see if any of my fellow PD compatriots were unable to complete this task. I thought in my head, damn inevitable diminishment. But that is how I saw life with Parkinson's disease in those early years. A diagnosis that could eventually rob me of my ability to do even the most basic tasks like getting out of a chair. This was a club that I didn't want to belong to, but it seemed as if I might not have a choice. Fast forward 10 years and I was asked to give the keynote address at the Michael J. Fox Foundation MVP dinner. After thanking them for giving me such an honor, I began my remarks with actually a request for a favor. Before I get started, does anyone here have any extra cinema they can spare me? Arms shot up like arrows as the room became a sea of hands waving little yellow pills at me. Quite impressed with their unanimous willingness to share, I had to admit to them all, oh, I'm just kidding. My husband Mark just wanted to see if I really could get everybody to, to reach into their pockets at the same time. My audience, which included Michael J. Fox, responded with a hearty laugh. That isn't always an easy thing to get from an audience when, you're, when your address is about having a progressive neurologic disease that currently has no cure. But this was no ordinary audience. This was an audience simpatico with me and indeed with each other which is why I knew they would all raise their hands in a gesture to help me. With 14 years under my belt, I have come to truly appreciate gatherings I invited to attend, like this one today, because they are so not about our diminishment. A symposium like this gives even an old pro like me a chance to learn something new that might help me in this fight. And if I'm lucky, I am able to reciprocate the favor by sharing my story and perspective with all of you. While our stories may be different, although mine and Alan seem to be quite the same, I find that there is a collective understanding between each of us of what it is like to have this disease, an understanding that we are in this together, sharing a disease that has a language and experiences that we all understand and are all comfortable with. So let me start today with a heartfelt thank you for this invitation and for giving me the opportunity to say to you all, welcome to the club. For me, getting a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease changed my perspective on just about everything I knew to be true overnight. As it turns out, being a physician did not give me a head start in knowing what to expect um, 
after getting the diagnosis. The truth was I was 47 years old and knew nothing about this disease and actually knew no one else with the diagnosis. In fact, it was a full year before I met anyone else who was stomping around in a pair of Parkinson's boots. Once diagnosed, I now saw myself as a patient more than a physician and, and equated having a diagnosis with me being ill. These two newly drummed up mis misperceptions on my part created enough fear that I chose silence over disclosure and the need to safely guard my new secret. So as not to bum you all out, let me just say that this, let me just give you this spoiler alert. This story does not end sadly. It only started that way. True, this road has had its share of ups and downs, but I can honestly say that Michael J. Fox got it right when he said, for everything I have lost from this disease, I have gained, some, I have gained something of much greater value. So in 2006, I was 46 years old and felt like I was doing well navigating life. I was a busy OBGYN, raising three daughters with my husband, Mark. And as luck would have it, I had just also been trained and certified to become a moil, which is to say, I was now able to perform ritual circumcisions on newborn Jewish baby boys. I'll let the irony of that one sink in for a while, but I promise to come back to it. Health-wise, my only complaint was some nagging pain in my left shoulder that I was certain was caused by my rambunctious attempt to lift weights. I consulted an orthopedist who treated me with a cortisone injection in my shoulder. Needing another injection six months later, I happened to mention that ever since the first injection, my arm, the, the pain in my shoulder was now accompanied by a weird sensation in my arm that I could only describe as feeling like caffeine was running through it. First looking a bit befuddled, he then looked me square in the eye and said, that's what crazy people tell me. Not the response you'd expect from a reputable physician, but let me, when I tell you that this reputable orthopedist was also my old college boyfriend, put it into that context and his comment should surprise no one. He handed me an order for a CT scan of my neck. And while I thought about it, giving him a kick in the shins, I got the sense that he might be in fact worried about me. But at this point in time, normal CT and no mention of Parkinson's disease. As the year progressed, so did the sensations in my arm. Knowing nothing about Parkinson's disease, I had every reason to believe that my symptoms were the direct result of the steroid injections I had received to treat my shoulder. I imagined some sort of muscle or nerve injury. I even consulted Dr. Google, who gave me no reason to think otherwise. I brought my diagnosis with me to a neurologist who for all intents and purposes, completely ignored it. He asked me some questions, tapped on my knees and ankles, told me to have me touch my finger to my nose and then to the tip of the pencil, which by the way, I executed flawlessly. But when he had me walk down his hallway, he saw all he needed to see, no left arm swing. Why hadn't I noticed that? After my unwitting jaunt down the hall, he confirmed that my symptoms were not as a result of the injections I had received. But he, said, he, but he remarked, I think you have something else. So let's get an MRI. The truth was he knew. The absent swing of my left arm gave me away, but I wasn't leaving without knowing what he, mean by, what he meant by something else. So I insisted he explain. Recognizing the sad look that comes when a physician has to give a patient a difficult diagnosis, I had just a second to brace myself before he said, I believe you have Parkinson's disease. Whoa, you know, some things you just don't see coming. My mind began to race. What, isn't that an old guy's disease? And, why, and while I, know, I now know better, at the time it seemed ridiculous. Who gets Parkinson's disease in one arm at age 47? I left his office with nothing more than an order for an MRI and a strong belief that I was right and he was wrong. I went into the MRI with the misunderstanding that since Parkinson's is a brain disease that it would be ruled out with a normal MRI. So when his secretary called, his secretary, not him, the secretary called to let me know the MRI was normal, I was happy because it proved me right and led me, leading me to tell everyone that he was an idiot. A year went by, symptoms persisting, time for a second opinion, which confirmed that I was wrong. It was Parkinson's disease. Because I had never believed this would be the diagnosis, I went to this appointment alone. With my husband traveling back from a trip with our girls, I somehow got myself home, pulled out my journal and wrote the following. I have Parkinson's disease. My life starts over from here, but I don't know where to start. One of my first decisions upon getting the news was to decide whether or not to share my diagnosis. I am sure that there are many others uh, here today who have also wrestled with the decision to tell or not to tell, like Alan and me. Maybe some of you still are. Parkinson's often carries with it a public misconception of diminished ability. And that was just scary enough to convince me that it would be best to keep it all a secret, which I did for almost three years. I had read Michael J. Fox's story and learned that he kept his diagnosis secret for seven years. 
Granted, he was busy with an acting career, so he had a lot at stake, but so did I. As an OBGYN, I was working long hours delivering babies and performing surgeries. If he could keep it secret, then so could I. I did tell some of my family and a small handful of friends, but it actually took the better part of a year for me to get beyond telling more than the first six people. The mothers, the patients, the school parents, the teachers, the neighbors, and the medical community where I practiced had no idea. And because I was keeping it secret, I worried a lot about getting worse and thus worried a lot about being found out. I think that if I had not believed it necessary to keep my diagnosis a secret, I would have been a different Parkinson's patient. But for once in my life, I was just too chicken. And as I already admitted, just like that, I had become the person with Parkinson's who happened to be a physician instead of the physician who happened to be a person with Parkinson's. Fortunately, one of my friends who had been sworn to secrecy had a very different take on my future. She was confident that in time, I would be brave enough to disclose my Parkinson's while continuing to work as a productive and accepted physician. That who I was meant to be was to be the determined woman who accepts her disease and begins the public dialogue of how a person can be healthy and work and be a surgeon and a mother and even a moil and have Parkinson's disease. She believed that I could be the person that erases some of the stigma associated with it. She then chuckled. Yes, yeah, she chuckled and said, Karen Jaffe, I cannot wait to see all the things you will eventually do to make this work. At the time, I recall thinking it would take something extraordinary for me to have that kind of strength. Now, the first thing to do on my to-do list was to find myself a doctor. Certainly, I would want a doctor who knows a thing about Parkinson's, a thing or two about Parkinson's disease, but just as importantly, with my decision to keep this secret, I also needed one whose office was nowhere near mine. I chose Dr. David Riley, who is the head of the Movement Disorder Center at University Hospitals, and whose office was at the main campus. My office was at the Green Ro Community Medical Building known as the Green Road Building on the second floor, Suite 210. Remember that, Green Road, second floor, Suite 210. It was a safe eight miles away. Trying to stay under the radar, I made my appointment without disclosing that I was a doctor. So like the rest of the world, I too had to wait three months to meet the man who I hoped would save me from the situation. A few days before I was scheduled to meet Dr. Riley, I received a courtesy reminder call about the appointment and they wanted to let me know they had moved their offices to the Green Road Building, second floor, suite 216. What, in other words, right next door to mine? Are you kidding me? The UH Movement Disorder Center were now my neighbors? I had to sneak in like Mata Hari, wearing dark glasses, hiding behind magazines in the waiting room and asking my new doctor if he had a back door I could use to slip in and out of his office. And he said, yes, but unfortunately that door leads right into your office. We both laughed. Funnier still was how the three of us made a plan for me to get back to my own office. Mark had to sneak a peek out of the waiting room door, looking in both directions to see if the coast was clear of anyone who might know me and wonder what I was doing coming out of the movement disorder center. Ultimately, like Alan said, going it alone, it was not easy. I remained unconnected to any Parkinson's community that might have provided some, some balance for my worries. My worries about getting worse, which in turn created worries about being found out. I heeded the warning that attending a support group was a place that I might get recognized or perhaps worse, see people who are more symptomatic than me, which would be unsettling. This was a warning I took seriously, but in hindsight, this was a missed opportunity for community engagement and an advice I regret taking. Still undercover in November of 2009, I attended my first Michael J. Fox Foundation event. For me, the scientific research roundtable was exhilarating, thought-provoking, and of course, optimistic. The funny thing was, as nervous as I was to be in a, room full of folk, in a room full of folks with Parkinson's disease, as I looked around the room, I couldn't pick out one person who I thought unequivocally had Parkinson's disease. And as much as I enjoyed the research update, what came next turned out to be a pivotal moment I didn't see coming. Throughout the, throughout the audience, people were asked to stand and share their heartwarming stories of how they had come to donate their time and money to the Fox Foundation entity known as Team Fox, doing so because either they or a loved one had Parkinson's disease. And while person after person spoke with such sincerity about the power of their voice and how their efforts to raise funds would make a difference, I sat at my table with tears rolling down my cheeks, thinking that I was light years away from having such an impact. In the end, I had the opportunity to introduce myself to Michael. I wanted to thank him because it was his story that I turned to on the day I was handed this diagnosis and that it was his story that continued to inspire me and give me hope for my future. I returned home to Cleveland and for the first time since being diagnosed, I was ready to ask myself, who am I meant to be? Hiding my Parkinson's disease for three years brought me to think that I was actually perpetuating the stigma by keeping it secret. If I was going to wait to disclose it until I could no longer hide it, then I would be seen only as a symptomatic Parkinson's patient and not as the woman who with proper treatment 
could continue to work, which I did so for five more years. So with the support of my family, I began to let go of my secret. I would start with my partners. If somewhere down the road I needed to cut back, they were the ones who would be most affected by it. When I told them they were gracious beyond belief, offering me support and the freedom to do as I saw fit. Not long after, I woke one morning and decided this would be the day I started telling my patients. As it turns out, the day was quite busy and the right opportunity didn't present itself until the last patient on my schedule. Jill, a lovely soft-spoken woman in her late 60s, was a patient I had taken care of for years. Being the last patient, we had a bit of time to chat after her appointment. She asked about my family and told me I looked well. The time was right. And so I said, Jill, I want to share with you that I have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Jill took a few seconds and then responded with this. Dr. Jaffe, no matter how much your hand shakes, I'm still gonna let you put your finger up my butt. Now that was an endorsement I hoped all my patients would give me. Though the Fox Foundation's mission is to find a cure, I think a byproduct of that mission for anyone who joins Team Fox is the willingness to face any stigmas associated with Parkinson's disease and then tell the world about it. I was ready. I decided to have a Team Fox fundraiser for which I knitted 200 women's shawls that over a few years raised $20,000 for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. To be part of the foundation's important work felt great. So my husband, Mark, and I took it a step further and began hosting an annual event we called Shaking with Laughter, a fun night of food, comedy, and jazz in a beautiful downtown Cleveland theater, which over its six year run raised over a million dollars for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Now that I was out in the open, other PD patients or their family members would call me from near and far asking for my advice. One woman called not knowing what to do. She had lived with MS for years and had never hid hidden it from her family or friends. But getting the newly added diagnosis of PD had her in a tailspin, wanting to keep it secret from all. When I asked her why, she told me that it was because Parkinson's disease has a stigma that MS just doesn't have. Where does this stigma come from and why do so many of us feel the weight of it? For some of us for many years. I remember taking a call from a woman in Baltimore who had been diagnosed just three weeks earlier and hadn't slept a wink ever since. She was very concerned that this would affect her job stability. When I asked, she said, I'm a real estate agent. So I told her, I'm a surgeon. She, she replied, oh, I think you've got me on that one. The stories I've been told by people whose friends, family, and sometimes even their doctors think it best not to tell are too numerous to count. Truthfully, if I could do this all over again, I would not put myself or my family through the painful experience of having to keep such a secret. Happily, I found that closing that one door allowed us to, be to begin to open others. My work with Team Fox led to an invitation to be on the Michael J. Fox Foundation Patient Advisory Council, which I still am today. I love having a front row seat to all the exciting work the foundation is doing. From a professional medical standpoint, I also understand the importance of clinical research and the difficulty studies have with patient re recruitment. In 2012, the Fox Foundation was launching a landmark study called PPMI to identify biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. This study is ongoing, having enrolled hundreds of people with Parkinson's disease, as well as hundreds of control volunteers. For my husband, Mark, this gave him an opportunity to help me and so many other people with this disease, for which I am extremely grateful. With the help of my neurologist and a small dose of medication, I continue to work, delivering babies, scheduling surgeries, and fulfilling a much needed role in the Cleveland community, uh, is serving as one of two working oils. So here I was, an OBGYN, well-versed in newborn circumcision with a license to administer preoperative anesthesia to help lessen the baby's discomfort. I found myself to be quickly high in demand. I was pretty sure that this was not the time to be adding Parkinson's to my resume. I certainly didn't want to be asked over and over again, did you see the Seinfeld episode about the shaky moil? Do any of you care to guess how many of these circumcisions I attended where someone made a shaky moil joke without knowing about my PD? As it turns out, all of them. So it was customary after arriving at a family's home for me to proceed to a private room with the grandfather who would be tasked with holding the baby still while I gave him the numbing medication. On one occasion, as I was getting ready to numb the baby, the grandfather looked up at me and said, I need to tell you something. I looked down at him and I said, yes. He goes, I have Parkinson's disease. So I looked down at him with a twinkle in my eye and said, then I think I ought to tell you that so do I. We both had a good laugh and proceeded downstairs, deciding together that it was best not to make an announcement of this coincidence, knowing that we were both, without question, capable of fulfilling our duties. While I can no longer work as an OBGYN or a MOIL, I'm okay with it. I was honored to have been a physician. I knew many of my patients for the entire 25 years of my practice, sharing many experiences together. One of my greatest strengths as a physician was my ability to listen and offer guidance. 
no longer having the weight of a secret to hide and being a Parkinson's patient who also happens to be a physician, I found myself in a unique position to give counsel and comfort to many of the families in this community who are living and dealing with this disease. I welcomed this opportunity to help, but I was a bit surprised at how often and how many people were looking for advice, looking for information and looking for emotional support. It didn't take long to find that I was hearing the same story over and over again. Stories about how the medical experience was far from perfect. I understand the challenges that physicians face, more patients, less time, and an ever-increasing volume of knowledge to keep up with, but it still pained me to hear such tales, tales of other newly diagnosed Parkinson's patients who, regardless of their age, often said they didn't see it coming. Not knowing what questions to ask, they admitted to nodding their head as if they understood, when in truth, they didn't hear most of what their doctor was, being, was telling them. And too often, patients were sent home with little more than a prescription and a directive to return in six months. If a physician doesn't recognize and address this state of disbelief, the patient will start their new journey without the information needed to meet this challenge, which can lead to worry, fear, social isolation, and stigma. Even today, the stigma of PD has the power to keep people living in secrecy, some for many years out of fear for their job security, and believe it or not, out of embarrassment. Not only did I know what this felt like, and believe me, it wasn't good, but I, also, but I was also hearing it from so many others. Looking back, I see now that these conversations were the spark for my dream of there being a place to help people learn to live well with Parkinson's. As a community physician, I had become familiar with a wonderful Cleveland organization called The Gathering Place that serves to provide cancer patients and their families with valuable resources from the point of diagnosis, services that help to keep cancer patients well-armed and ready to tackle what is ahead of them. Being taken out of the shadows, cancer patients are seen by their physicians as partners in their care and not just recipients. And best of all, these types of services and programs were instituted in major medical centers across the United States. I wasn't aware of any place like this for people with Parkinson's. My question to the world is, why not? Shortly after being diagnosed, I joined a PD cycling study at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation with Dr. Jay Alberts and found that the key to my physical and emotional wellness was for me to step up my game in regard to exercise. It was around this time UH had their first PD boot camp, a splendid day of information sharing exercise demonstrations and outreach, which started me to think that one day of this per year was certainly not enough. People with Parkinson's needed these sorts of programs and resources every day. Propelled by the easing of my symptoms from exercise, my recommendations for those who reached out to me was for robust activity whenever possible. But for most, especially those who were not avid exercisers, the lack of organized exercise programs specifically designed for Parkinson's patients proved to be a barrier to making this happen. I had a hunch that what people were looking for did not exist. A place that there was no stigma, a place that defined community, a place like the gathering place was to cancer patients and their families. Finally, the answer to the question, who was I meant to be, was coming into focus. Let's fast forward a bit. Sometimes you find out that the job you trained so hard for and did with enjoyment and fulfillment for many years is actually not the job that brings you the most satisfaction or that needs you the most. When I was thrown the monkey wrench known as PD, I wrestled with it, I struggled to accept it, I hit it, I wrestled with it some more, and at some point, I figured out that I was not put on this planet to just have Parkinson's disease, I was here to do something about it. As a physician, I know that, that a patient's needs for information, education, support, and in the case of Parkinson's disease, exercise extends far beyond the physician's office. Recognizing the lack of comprehensive education, support, and physical wellness services for our, company, our community's PD families, I became one of the founders of an amazing place that we call In Motion. In 2013, I joined forces with four other like-minded people in my hometown of Cleveland. My founding partners, the late Alan Goldberg, the late Lee Handel, my neurologist, Dr. David Riley, and Ben Rossi, personal trainer and athletic performance coach, to begin the design and implementation of In Motion a wellness center that removes all barriers, including cost for people with Parkinson's disease in Northeast Ohio. In Motion opened its doors in March of 2015. Within a couple of hours of opening, 60 people had signed up for group exercise classes. Six months later, we expanded its programs to include multiple classes offered five days a week. These include our signature fitness class called Better Every Day, boxing, Tai Chi, yoga, spinning, dance, art, and music therapy, drumming support groups, as well as medical and non-medical lecture series that help people understand the disease and connect with the community that supports them. In Motion is a place that is pushing the envelope, meeting the needs of the young and the old, bringing together the newly diagnosed with those who have years of this disease under their belts, exploring solutions through imagination and invention that have not yet been defined. Our mission is to help people with Parkinson's disease feel better every day, 
It's simple and easy to understand and it guides everything that we do. Almost seven years later, Emotion serves approximately 1,100 people in Northeast Ohio, has an operating budget of a million dollars, which is all philanthropically generated, an active board of 28 individuals, a staff of eight, staff of eight employees, and over 30 qualified coaches and trained volunteers. We are resolute in our promise to keep all of our programs and services free to our clients with PD and their care partners. Designed to strip away the stigma, decrease the social isolation, and to provide hope for families living with Parkinson's disease, In Motion is a place that brings wellness to a group that now calls themselves a community. As one of our clients described it, getting the diagnosis of PD was like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, a terrifying, a terrifying free fall that changed his life in a split second, but that In Motion had provided him with a soft landing a place to get stronger instead of having to crash and break into pieces. I want to now introduce you to my friend and fellow In Motion co-founder, Ben Rossi, who is also In Motion's program director. Earlier this week, I caught up with Ben to have him share some insight into how to live well with Parkinson's disease. Hey, Ben. Hi, Karen. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. So Ben, I'm here today with a group from Western Pennsylvania. Uh, they're attending a Parkinson's Foundation PD symposium. Um, directed at newly diagnosed and early stage Parkinson's disease. So can you talk to our audience about the importance and role of exercise uh, for those of us living with Parkinson's disease? Sure, sure. You know, so what we know is that Parkinson's doesn't stop and uh, you know, neither can you when it comes to your care for Parkinson's. You know, exercise is about creating resiliency in the brain, which means that you have the ability to spring back. And uh, learning new skills is what really creates and strengthens new movement. So. Um, exercise isn't completely neuroprotective, or meaning it really it can't slow the progression of your disease, but, but what it does for you, that there, there's many, many benefits that this purposeful activity or exercise can do for you. So, for example, improvement in your posture or, or increasing your gait. I know we should sit up straight. Uh, uh, you know, rigidity, being less fearful when you work out. Uh, more endurance, whether it's aerobic capacity or from muscle endurance based. Better cognitive ability, ability to multitask. Um, better balance, more confidence, better voice volume. All these things matter, you know, or how about less rigidity? Um, or really just safety, safety in your life. I mean, these are the type of things that exercise help. And, you know, I guess the, uh, the result is your improvement in your activities of daily living. That really would be the ultimate goal. So, you know, being able to get out of your car, getting up out, you know, out of a chair better, getting out of bed better. So functional. So. Functional. Functional improvement is really what matters, yeah. So, you know, so... I think also with exercise, there's three important facts that I always find interesting with Parkinson's. Um, so the average steps for a person with Parkinson's is 4,760 per day, um, which is 30% less than the age match person without PD. That's interesting, 30% less. Um, Are we 35% more lazy? It could be, no. <laughs> um, but how about 45 minutes of every hour sitting with a person with Parkinson's? So that means that 75% of your day is spent sedentary. Interesting, which brings me to my last fun fact, that the top barriers to exercise are number one, lack of time. Yet 75% of your day is sedentary. Um, fear of falling and low expectations. So those are all so, some big barriers to exercise for people with Parkinson's. So. Um, okay, well that's good advice. So what advice do you have for a person who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease but hasn't exercised in years? Oh, number one, it's never too late to start. You sure? I'm positive. Okay. You have to start where you are okay. and, and well, begin fair. to, to you know, develop your roadmap to success. What's that look like to you, right? Um, you know, to us at Emotion, it really starts with mentality. And that's what we've seen as, as the biggest thing to get you going. Getting the right attitude, having the right attitude, the right mentality to work. You know, learning to, to take charge of making a difference with your Parkinson's. Is it easier to do that if you've got a community that... <sighs> Yes, it is. It is because this this it's especially very isolating. You you need someone else. You need especially people. Especially if you around. haven't been exercising. Well, especially you need you need to be just embraced by a community of people that that are going through the same type of struggle. I mean, it matters. You know, it's important that you when you look at your Parkinson's that you really become a warrior in this, not worrying about what happened, not hiding from this, but but being a warrior in in, in your approach to being well. It really matters. But not going it alone. No, you can't. You really can't. You can't do it alone. It's, it's not the answer. And, and, and that's that's makes for more of a struggle, more anxiety driven. You know, and in motion, we really focus on the power of 212 degrees. And that really defines our mentality. And so at 211 degrees, water's hot. But at 212 degrees, water boils. And when water boils, it produces steam. 
and steam, steam can power, power a locomotive. locomotive. That's right. So one degree difference can create so much change. So that's why we talk about being 1% better every day at in motion. 1%, doing a little bit more today than you did yesterday is, is, is beyond powerful, but it's manageable. And it allows you to really, you know, approach this the right way. Well, that's and important because we find that lots of excuses not to exercise. Every excuse. And we all do. I mean, yeah. come on. We're human beings. That's what we yeah. do. But, but in terms of Parkinson's, it really can help how you, how you just walk down the street. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it really, really does matter. Um, I think, you know, if you're someone new and you, and you need that nudge to get going with exercise, um, something that we really look at and in motion is, is, you know, these essentials for brain change. What does that mean? Exercise for brain change essentials. And it really is, a, it's just a handful of things that make you think about what you need to do. How do you get started? So, so getting educated about exercise like we're doing today is so important. You know, it, it's, it becomes more than strength and, and flexibility and coordination, and it becomes more about optimizing your brain health, you know, more about decreasing symptoms and, and, and improving how you function. So it's not about getting into muscular shape. Yeah, we're not here to, no, yeah. it's well beyond that. Right. It's well beyond it. Yeah, it does being strong and that type of stuff make a difference? Yes, all that comes with it, but uh, it's, a, it's a lot different for us. And, and you know, it becomes this mentality of, you know, you need to get started now and you, and you really, it's either use it or lose it or use it to improve it. And we're all about, you know, we have more potential than we, than we think we do. So you gotta use it. And that, that's really when change happens. Um, being, being inactive is no good. Being, living a life of, of stress and anxiety is no good. That doesn't help us symptoms of Parkinson's, right? Mm -hmm. Stress is no good for it. Um, and I think that a couple others is really finding a team. And we'd already talked about how important it is for a community. And then that, that's really a big piece of your team. People that, that are on the same page with you, people that care about you, that want to help you, want to see you do better, people that are going through the same type of situation. Or, or how about coaches? You know, like in Emotion, we have all of our, you know, our Parkinson's qualified coaches. And that goes for everything, from Tai Chi's to yogas to dance. I mean, it's across the board. So what kind of resources does In Motion have that can we can share with other people who don't live in Cleveland? Well, I mean, the biggest one is our PD-101. And that, that is, that's starting from... Sort of from the ground level, and that was, you know, as you know, was developed because we we saw a, really a lack of education, lack of after diagnosis. What what do I do now? What, what, and what happened? So we really worked hard with Davis Finney Foundation to 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 create this manual manual to to learn about exercise, to learn about symptoms of Parkinson's, to learn about how to manage yourself, to be your self advocate, and then we tied it in conjunction with our foundations program to, to help people realize that they can exercise and they can do well and become a self. You know, build that self-efficacy uh, of best practice for exercise, and um, it's a great program. And prior to COVID, it, well, it's been a big deal at our facility. It really educates people to get started and get into our community. Uh, but with when COVID hit, you know, we, like I said earlier, it doesn't stop, and we had to find a way to to continue to bring that education and that resource to people with Parkinson's. And we realized that it can be done virtually, and that opens up a whole world of remote services, allowing us to reach other people in other communities. So what <clears> services <throat> does In Motion offer online? Well, I, I mean, I, right now, because of COVID, we put everything online. Everything. Every single, we were five days a week of classes prior to COVID. And, and I can tell you now that we, we've seen about 35,000 visits since COVID began, all virtually. So um, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So Ben, can you tell our audience how much this costs for them to participate? Well, it's expensive. Did you tell them to bring their checkbooks? Yeah. It's free of charge. Free. Everything we do is Isn't free. Yeah, it's the best thing in the world because we're here to eliminate barriers to this. Right. And, and we don't want anybody to get left behind. So so keeping it free is essential for us as founders, and that's will always remain. Since this is a um, Parkinson's Foundation event, mm -hmm. um, can you just spend a minute talking about the work that you've done with the Parkinson's Foundation mm -hmm. to create some uh, guidelines regarding exercise for Parkinson's? Well, yeah, you pretty much said it. So we've worked... Uh, uh, you and I had an awesome opportunity to go to Miami, and we met with the, the Parkinson's Foundation, which is that's where their, their main base is in Miami, and it was an opportunity to collaborate with some of the amazing organizations for Parkinson's around the country. And we all met and merged there, and, and one of the first main projects we did was develop this exercise guidelines for Parkinson's. What does it look like? What's the best practice? And that these are these are this is ongoing, but the first thing we produced was that guideline. It really said you know you should get. 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. You need to be doing exercise program that is amplitude based. That's right. that's that's functional based and, and, and you know, working on flexibility and being able to multitask and dual task and it, it's an excellent guideline that you can find on the Parkinson's Foundation website now that will really offer you a great direction. And it just goes to show how important 
exercise is. It's 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 as important as medications are. It's huge. Um, yes, it, you ha yes you need medication for Parkinson's. You need exercise right. just as much. And so to to skip that part of you know your skip that part of your the benefits of 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 a, of a uh, therapeutic me method, it would be silly. It would be a mistake. Big mistake. It would be a big mistake. You, you need to feel well and you need to operate with this. Well, Ben, how do people uh, get involved in our online programming? Well, Just... you start by visiting beinmotion.org. That's the easiest way. Go to our right. website, check everything out, find your direction, and, and get started with us. Get signed up. You can get, The best contact would be Debbie Rossman um, at InMotion, and she'll set you up and get you going in PD 101. Great. Get Wonderful. your assessment, get started, and all that good stuff. Ben, thanks for filling us in. My pleasure. Great. I'm back. So in my experience, the Parkinson's community is one that knows how to roll up their sleeves and get things done. There are many things within reach if we, you feel inspired to try. Not long ago, before COVID, I was called by a woman whose father had Parkinson's disease. Their small town had no community-based PD resources, so she started a GoFundMe campaign in hopes to raise uh, money to create something like in motion. Granted, COVID changed the landscape of how she could execute that, um, and also with limited funds. So I made the following suggestions to her. Start with bringing a working group of voices to the table and from there ideas can become reality. Support groups for PWPs and care partners are essential and preferably not necessarily together. Find a community building that is able to lend you space at no charge or if the situation warrants it, utilize Zoom. I suggested that they acquire some copies of the Every Victory Counts manual put out by the Davis Finney Foundation, which they offer at no charge and which can serve as the basis of a great educational program. The Michael J. Fox Foundation has a tre treasure trove of free online and print materials, as well as very interesting video series. The Brian Grant Foundation has a super online nutritional program that is also available at no cost. He also suggested that they offer to send a local PT or fitness professional to get PD specific training with any number of programs, such as Becky Farley's Power for Life program in Tucson or the Mark Morris Dance for PD program in New York City. Rock Steady Boxing, Pedaling for Parkinson's and Delay the Disease also offer PD training programs. Consider bringing an existing program to your area and expand offerings as an interest grows. I know people who have been given space for their Parkinson's classes at the local Y, in boxing gyms and community centers, simply because they asked. It turns out folks can be quite generous. Although not available at the time she and I spoke, I would be remiss to not extend an invitation from the InMotion team to explore the online services we offer. With so many opportunities that I gave her within reach, she felt like it was Christmas in July. My best advice for how to begin making a difference in your community is this, share your story. Just like Alan said, share your story. Most everyone knows someone living with Parkinson's disease, many of whom are looking for someone to talk to. Be the one who starts the dialogue in your community and that might lead to something bigger than yourself. While certainly long overdue, Parkinson's disease is catching up, grabbing some of the attention it rightly deserves. I believe that we will all be witness to some much needed changes for those living with Parkinson's disease, as well as for those in the medical field who are treating it. Just as cancer centers took the reins decades ago, today's P Parkinson's thought leaders like Drs. Ray Dorsey, Ray Dorsey, Mike Oaken, and Boss Bloom are uniting to push this disease into the public sphere. They get it. Parkinson's is a complex diagnosis and as such deserves more than us being handed a prescription to be filled. Together, education, advocacy, and the grassroots efforts of centers like In Motion go a long way to filling in the gaps, hopefully helping us to meet our challenges with grace and strength. Thank you for listening, and I'll leave you with one more thing. How to make a Parkinson's lemon into a sweet lemonade. The key is to start by picking out the most sour lemons you can find. I suggest that you take the ones that you worry and fear will create stigma about your lemonade and place them in isolation. Carefully use a sharp knife to reduce the impact of any one lemon in half. Take each half lemon and squeeze it like you mean it, but you might find it therapeutic. Every day you must stir the lemonade yourself keeping it in motion as you add the sugar as needed, watching for the lemons to bravely transform under your caring eye into your vision of the perfect lemonade. Don't forget to share with friends. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffe. That was incredible uh, insight and ideas for the folks. Um, Casey and I had a chance to take a road trip up to Cleveland back in, I think it was 2018. And uh, 
visit in motion, which is truly unique. I, I have I've never heard of another community based program like that. Um, and tell us what's happening right now with in motion. Well, thanks. Uh, it's been a uh, it's been fun talking to you guys today. Um, in motion is we're very proud of it, David. It's it's um, it was one of those things where the group of us decided if we build it, they will come. Mm. Our board didn't necessarily believe that would be the case, but in fact, it has. And then, of course, um, five years into our um, into this journey, we ran out of space, and uh, so we went ahead and did some uh, heavy duty thinking and decided that it was best if we built it, bought our own building. So about a year and a half ago, we bought a building and then COVID hit. So, so we haven't, we are just now moving into that building. It's been renovated completely and it's 20,000 square feet of wonderful space with, with uh, space just for, it's probably 10 times the amount of space that we had in the other place. And it allows us to bring the care partners back in because we care very much about them. And it, for a while, they, there wasn't room in the classrooms for them. So now the care partners are back in. Uh, we will continue our remote services. Um, so for people who don't live in Cleveland who want to participate, they can. Uh, and as Ben mentioned in the video, beinmotion.org is our, is our website and you can find that information there. So we have people from, Washington, uh, from California, uh, Washington, New York, Florida, uh, Chile, who, uh, who plug in and either use the online video series that we have or actually join in on a live class. Uh, it's incredible. In fact, uh, we were really kind of introduced to In Motion from uh, a fellow who participated in our exercise classes here, Tom Larkin, and Maureen actually are on with us today also. So shout out to Tom and Maureen, um, and thanks for the introduction. It's been incredible. Well, um, why don't we hold the questions off until the panel, if that's all right with you? Um, and, and maybe we can get everybody to join in and, and you know, discuss the questions then. Yeah, Sounds good? Yeah. All right. Well, folks, we're coming up on an, another exercise break. And, and speaking of shout outs, um, I just want to give a holler for uh, the group up in Meadville and, and Greg that are joining in today and also the support group out in Indiana with uh, uh, Denise and Gingy and Deb. So. I hope you're enjoying it and thanks so much for joining in. Um, we have uh, another exercise break coming up with uh, John and Josefa Domingos, John Dean and Josefa Domingos. Um, so take a break, do some dual task exercise. We'll